Psalm 46 verse 1 says that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in a time of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you that right now, according to your word and your promises, we don't have to be afraid, but we can be in faith in Christ Jesus. Lord, we ask for your help right now. You have the precious Holy Spirit on assignment in our lives, in our homes, in our living rooms, helping us to get the word of God, not just in our ears and our eyes, but in our hearts. Unfold the word of God, the seed of God, that it might enter our heart and bring forth everlasting life in Jesus' name. Say amen, amen, praise God. How to have part three. And we're going to talk in this session about good communication, good communication, even great communication. God's Word gives us very practical steps on how to have. And that's why this series is so critically important. Too many believers have rights and privileges that they never employ. You have to know how to possess whatever it is that God has given you. In Deuteronomy 1 verse 8, God said to the nation of Israel, Look, I've set the land before you. Go in and possess the land. It's not enough to have rights to the banquet, my friend. Practically speaking, you've got to eat. You've got to have it for it to truly be of any use, nutritional value, or blessing to you. At this very second, God is saying to you, Listen. I've set many things before you. I've promised and delivered for you, but now you have got to possess what I've given to you. You've got to have it. Do you really know how to have, how to be a haver? I've spoken with couples who just don't know how to have. They love each other, but they're miserable. They're failing all because they don't know the secret of how to have. I've spoken with successful business people, talented artists, gifted ministers, and all of them just keep failing, falling, failing, grasping, and eventually they even lose their health. Why? They don't understand God's wisdom for how to have. Learn to employ so that you can enjoy. This session particularly is how to have good communication. Listen closely. This is a life skill that we all need. If you don't learn this, how in the world will you teach it to your children? Children suffer from great ignorance in this area. You don't want that, do you? So let's learn to work this Jesus principle that we're studying right now. Listen to Jesus lay out this life skill for us all. Mark chapter 4, verse 25. For to him who has will more be given, and from him who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. This isn't Jesus' opinion. This is an absolute law of life, period. So we must learn the practical application of this statement. Every one of us must learn to perceive, to believe, to receive. Worldly welfare programs contradict this truth. They give a person just enough allowance to corrupt their motivation, steal their self-worth, and feed them third-rate food and some cigarettes. Contrary to popular belief, today's welfare is not biblical. Habitual handouts impair and blind your perception. Governments trade entitlements for control over people's lives. But when you're informed, you perceive, believe, and receive from God. So yes, I want you to get the dollar, but God wants you to know how to have the dollar. God wants you to get the relationship, get married, but know how to have the marriage. The Lord wants you to get healed, but he wants you to know how to have a healthy life. As I told you in part one, if you don't learn how to have, you'll find yourself getting had over and over and over. Whether it's relationships, career, money, and what we're going to talk about in this episode, how to have good communication. If you don't learn how to have, you'll get had every time. If you can't discern good communication, you'll get had by lies all day long. Jesus is the expert on communication. John 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word's Jesus. God doesn't do anything but that he starts with communication. Genesis 1 says God created everything. How? By speaking his word. That's called communication. 
You've got to have good communication to live successfully. You've got to have good communication to have a great marriage. You've got to have good communication to parent successfully. You've got to have good communication to be an effective leader. You must have good communication to be a leader, a spouse, a friend, a parent. This goes for all of us. Do you want a life skill to move you forward? Get some good communication going on. As we were learning, life is full of havers and not havers, period. And the thing is, you get to decide which you'll be. As God said in Deuteronomy 30, he said, here's life or death, you choose. And this whole haver or not haver principle works in the critical area of communication. There's a simple law in life that says you attract what you are. You attract who you are. And Jesus said in Luke 6 verse 44 that your communication represents your heart. That's who you are. Your words speak, your actions speak, your silence, your generosity, your selfishness, your attention, your neglect. You are a walking, talking representation of communication, whether you know it or not. George Bernard Shaw, the famous 19th century playwright, said this, the single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place. Some experts claim a basic rule of 14. People need to get a message 14 times to receive it. Microsoft did a study and discovered people need 6 to 20 repetitions to get the message. As you can guess, divorce attorneys say one of the top reasons for marriage breakdown is communication issues. In every area, we need to know how to have good communication. With God's Word and the help of the Holy Spirit, we're going to learn the practical application of one of the premier life skills necessary to all success, how to have good communication. God wants you to perceive what He set before you and possess it. Have it. Do your words tend to get you in trouble? Do you go from one misunderstanding to another misunderstanding? Do you speak the words but struggle to convey the meaning? the intent? Do you hear the words but often misunderstand? Or worse, do you get angry, irritated, upset? Is your social media getting you in trouble? Hmm? Are you pressure talking even when you text? <sighs> Have you been hurt, disappointed, abused, neglected? Is it possible that you filter all of your communication through the filter of unresolved issues and conflicts? I really like this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. People fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they have not communicated with each other. And if you don't know how to have good communication, you will sabotage what's good in life. God gives good gifts, but we sabotage the blessings when we don't know how to have. Remember, our theme text is Mark chapter 4, verse 25. To him that has, more will be given, and to him that doesn't have, even what he does have will be taken away from him. But look what Jesus just said before that in Mark chapter 4, verse 12. In order that they may indeed look and look, but not see and perceive, and may hear and hear, but not grasp and comprehend, lest happily they should turn again, and it, their willful rejection of the truth, should be forgiven them. Jesus is talking about information that's never germinating into communication. So it becomes truth rejected and aborted. If you see, but don't perceive, you cannot perceive, believe, or receive. Communication is not simply talking, but Jesus points out how critical it is to hear. He's teaching his disciples here, telling them the critical failure of communication is a phenomenon devastating many people. They see and hear, but they don't truly perceive, he says. Therefore, they can't believe, and so they cannot receive any excellent outcome from the truth. Is this starting to hit close to home? We've got churches full of people that see but don't perceive. Therefore, they don't truly believe. And so they stay stuck in their mess, never receiving what they really need. This is why there's such a trend to redefine grace as a license to live in sin. Not having and defer all personal responsibility and blame away from us. 
Spiritual socialism is a lie meant to steal a person's authority in Christ Jesus. Not having never pleases God. Never. Look, that may be some people, but that's not you. No, sir. You're already taking responsibility for the have, and you're not content with a broke down version of grace that shifts blame onto God. Deferring blame might feel good for a minute or two. Remember, Adam blamed God for giving him his woman. Eve, she blamed the serpent for telling her a story. Cain scorned God for liking keepers better than sacrificers. Oh, Stephen, you didn't just go there, did you? (laughs) When an individual is a not-haver, they communicate it. They blame others. They defer responsibility. They push down the other guy using scorn, criticism, accusation, slander. There's a huge difference between having something and being had by something. Most people know that they should have good communication, but feel had by their soul issues. Life is much more dynamic than this flat, limited dimension of black and white words on paper. We communicate through our words, tone, expression, our body language, our eyes, our attention, or lack of attention, our gestures, our pictures, responsiveness, our silence. Oh, yes. Passive-aggressive behavior communicates, but don't forget, all communication is seed. So, if you're using muted, silent control tantrums, ghosting people, you're writing your own future. What you sow toward others, you author into your own future. When you wake up forgotten, alone, sad, and mad, remember, you communicated this. Now, you're getting had by it. Some Christians think that because their passive-aggressive posture is not directly mentioned in Scripture that it's sanctioned and even approved by God. No. You know that old saying, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Well, that's a control tactic, plain and simple. It's passive-aggressive and inspired by evil. Don't ever use it. It's wrong. It pleases the devil. King Ahab, a guy in the Bible, Jezebel's evil husband, was a passive-aggressive man and sowed very evil things. Jezebel used her communication to try and control people. Yes, even the local pastor, if you can imagine. You see, you don't need words to try and control people. As I've said, people use silence to express their mood. Ghosting, we call it in the social media world. But either way, it's disrespect and it's seed for failure. You're being had by your untrained soul. You're authoring unpleasantness into your future with passive-aggressive communication. Remember, Jezebel, she became dog food. Hmm. So let's flip over to what's good that overcomes evil. Excellence. Excellence. That's such a great word, excellence. It's the standard in many areas of performance, business, organizations like churches, and yes, personally, Be a person of excellence. The problem is, too often, it's dishonestly defined, and let's face it, if you don't have honesty, your excellence is counterfeit. You excel at being deceived, a great deceiver, an extreme Jezebel or Ahab, but we want the real thing, don't we? Excellence in communication requires understanding of communication, both delivery and reception. Who cares how good you broadcast if the intended party can't receive the message? Researchers say something interesting that generally speaking, we remember 10% of what we hear, 50% of what we see, 70% of what we say, and 90% of what we hear, see, say, and do. We're on a mission to present the truth of God's word to you freely. That's what we do here at Living Room Church. And with his anointing power, every minute of these presentations require hours and hours of work, research, prayer, study, production, practical application. And even with all of that preparation, it's worthless to you if you can't get your antenna up and pay attention. You gotta pay attention. Did you know that God's word says in Proverbs 4, verse 1, 2, pay attention in order to gain Too many people refuse to pay, so they never get to gain and play. Pay attention to God's word, my friend. Pay attention. 
No matter how freely we give you this good news, no matter how hot now we serve this spiritual nutrition to you, it's worthless if you can't break the dullness of our today generation and pay attention. The Bible says it's what you've got to do. It's the admission fee to the blessing of God. You've got to pay and the price is your attention. And here's the shocking thing. The Bible predicts that very, very few people will be able to scrape the fat out of their ears, shake off the dullness of today's low frequency roar and actually tune into Jesus' words of life. People want events. They want free coffee. They want free childcare, entertainment, pancakes and bacon. Well, then, then maybe, maybe you may sort of commit. Uh, I might show up and listen if it's funny, if it's light and easy on the mind and the thinking, if it's kind of relevant to my whole me world thing I've got going on, you know, that's my deal, baby. But that's not you. Thank God that's not you. You've decided that you want Jesus' life instead of Atlanta housewives. You want God's wisdom instead of the crazy thinking of some Netflix producer. You want more. The protection of God for your kids instead of foolish social reform from a power-hungry politician. All of this requires shared understanding with God. Good communication. When the truth is transferred and received, that's excellence. Look at this call to attention in God's word for an outcome that's good, very good. Proverbs 16, verse 20. He who pays attention to the word of God will find good. Pay attention, get retention. This is straightforward communication from God, my friend. Where do you devote your attention? Are you paying attention to what delivers the goods, the heavenly goods? Here's some practical for us all how to have good communication. You must perceive to believe to receive. Make no mistake, that requires attention. Now, simply put, and doing a little reverse engineering here, there is no receiving of anything that you fail to perceive. And as we've heard Jesus say in Mark 4, communication doesn't land until you perceive, understand, comprehend. Nodding your head and saying hallelujah doesn't mean jack if you're not truly perceiving. Pot and pan Christianity doesn't cut it. People are dying and it's for the lack of understanding, Hosea 4, 6 says. How is knowledge transferred? Through good, godly communication. How does God do everything he does? In the beginning, God spoke. He communicated. Parents, don't settle for hearing what your child says. You must perceive it. Husbands, don't think you've heard your wife by just being able to repeat her words. No, no. It's vital that you perceive what your spouse is communicating. You've got to get it to have it. One day, Pam and I were talking about something and she was intense, even a little angry about the issue. I was listening to her words, but I knew that there was so much more to what she was saying. I asked the Lord quietly in my heart, help me understand what Pam's really saying to me. Almost immediately, I heard deep on the inside of me, she's afraid. So I waited for the right moment because, you know, good communication needs the right context. I said, Pam, I know we're talking about this, but I just feel like there's something more. Are you feeling afraid? Is something worrying you? Her eyes brimmed up with tears and she began to tell me the fear that she was secretly fighting. After we talked about it and prayed about it, the other thing that we were initially talking about suddenly was resolved with zero effort. You've got to be able to read between the lines, my friend. You must learn the art of hearing what is not being said. Hearing God is knowing his written word and discerning the spirit of his breath between the lines. Religious people don't get Jesus. They're, they're tone deaf, not musically illiterate, but spiritually deaf. Instead of truth, they demand confirmation of their way. You got to have it my way. It's said that the purpose of social media is to facilitate better communication, but amplifying darkness in the human heart has the opposite effect. It reinforces the not having cultural ideology. Riding in the streets with give me, give me, give me chants only authorize destruction and poverty for the screaming activists. God has better, much, much better plans for you. How do we have? I mean, anything. 
Let me remind you of Jesus' words. Mark 4, verse 25. For to him who has, more will be given. And from him who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. To have, you've got to be a haver. That means you value it and celebrate it. Give thanks to God for it even before it's in your hands. You refuse to be disrespectful or to be had by it. Can we be had by communication? Yes. You must be intentional about your lawn. So even more so, you must be intentional about your communication. Get rid of weed makers. Stop listening to scorn, gossip, mocking, doubt, fear talk, catastrophic talk, bad news. Well, now, Stephen, I, I need to be informed. My friend, you can inform yourself right into crazy land. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, not the crazy talk of wicked people. Bad communication in, bad communication out. Fearful talk in, fearful talk out. Mental distortions in, mental distortions out. It's a serious crisis, and God wants you to be hope in the midst of this pandemic of mental health already smashing into this world. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Keep and guard your heart with all vigilance and above all that you guard, for out of it flow the springs of life. Above all that you guard, God says. Did you hear that? Are you hearing God's communication? Society can't solve what only God can remedy, so they play a deadly game of sleight of hand. They normalize mental health issues and call them choices, preferences, identity. Parents, listen to me. If you want to help your children grow up strong, functional, and be sound in their thinking, you must eliminate deceitful weed makers. Guard your children. Guard their hearts. Protect them from broken instructors and professors. An audience doesn't heal broken people. And sadly, your child will absorb all that confusion. Louis Pasteur, the 19th century microbiologist who helped discover the principles of vaccination and other breakthroughs in disease prevention, this guy perceived the threat of bacteria, he believed the threat of bacteria, and received the solution to the threat of bacteria by using sterilization. This, of course, prompted doctors to start washing their hands and surgery tools before operating on patients. Thank God for that, which, of course, was life-saving. It took some PBR. Think of that. If you don't perceive the threat of bad communication, you'll never believe or receive the necessary preventative to the terminal outcome of bad communication. The book of James gives us a master class on communication. Look at James 3, verse 2. For we all stumble and sin in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, never says the wrong thing, he is a perfect man, fully developed in character, able to bridle his whole body and reign in his entire nature. Finally, right? The secret to perfection. It's your communication. James goes on to compare the words spoken by the tongue as a small bridle that steers a powerful horse or a tiny rudder that steers a massive ship. Communication steers your life and has been steering your life. Do you believe that? In James' masterclass on communication, he gives us this powerful practical tip. James 1, starting at verse 19. Understand this, my beloved brother. Let every man be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to take offense, and to get angry. For man's anger does not promote the righteousness God wishes and requires. How to have good communication 101, right? Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to take offense and get angry. Some people seem to think that that means the exact opposite. Get angry, stay angry, talk about it as much as possible. Tell others how angry you are at other people. Stir up the offense over and over. Don't listen to wise counsel, but just keep speaking your offense. No, for Peter and James and John's sake, no, don't author such a pathetic future for yourself. That communication is evil and it will write a terrible future for you. So don't do it. You want peace. So speak God's peace. You want joy. So talk his joy. You want love. Therefore, exercise being patient, kind and refrain from jealousy and envy. 1 Corinthians 13 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm nothing. Again, nothing. That's because empty words lack power. No love, no power. Do you want true friendship? Then you must know how to speak the language of friendship. Good communication involves risk. It requires transparency, honesty, and investment. Will the other person reject my thoughts? 
If you're trying to build trust, you must risk your heart because good communication represents the heart. If it's a funny story, an anecdote, will the other person receive it, enjoy it, be bored, disinterested, look away? Good communication is like a great pizza. We share the pizza pie by each having a slice that becomes our own. We share one whole thing by taking individual slices to make them totally our own. Good communication is a whole thing cut into slices that we each make our own. What's on your pizza? Pepperoni? Mushroom? Is it thin crust or Chicago deep dish? We've all got preferences and there's nothing wrong with that. It's part of who we are and it's also part of the cost we pay to have great relationships. Shared understanding is essential. Are you so insistent on your toppings for communication that you refuse to make the effort to hear anything other than your own ideas? How can you grow, be discipled if you're always insistent on your crust, your toppings, your style? Be quick to hear, slow to speak. Learn to have good communication. Listen. Are you moved by what moves others? Or are you quick to say, yeah, I've heard that before, or you think that's a big deal. Wait until you hear this. You're stripping all the toppings off your pizza and making a mess. No one wants to share with a pizza topping mutilator. If you can't hear someone else's heart, then your message challenged. You are the weaker one at the table. The weakest person always controls the dynamic in the room. Notice how a newborn baby calls all the shots. I've seen educated adults on a plane going goo, 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 desperately trying to quiet their wailing baby on a crowded flight. In a family dynamic, notice how the weaker communication challenge person is the one everyone has to dance around. In a work environment, the weak, volatile person gets all the margin. Everyone's afraid to put any demand on them because no one can afford the toppings on their pizza. Rotten anchovies. <laughs> this goes back to part two on relationships, but good communication is first determined by the lowest denominator. You can't give wisdom to a fool. The communication isn't compatible. If you want to learn to communicate well, learn how to have pizza with others and enjoy it. You know what I mean. Nobody likes dishonesty when it comes to communication. Good communication must be authentic. Good communication must have shared understanding. Who we are determines what we perceive. What's that mean? Consider this. We see everything from the perspective of our identity. Who you are decides your perspective and therefore what you perceive. Follow that through now. What you perceive, you believe, you receive. Does that mean the outcome of what you receive in life is already basically decided? Some call this predestiny. Ultimately, the cake is already baked, but is it? At the start, I told you that you attract who you are, but God loves you. Almighty God can disrupt and interrupt the tide of brokenness and evil in our life. He can change everything, but you must let him in. Still your choice. Only you can decide for you if you're willing to hear the voice of God and let his son Jesus give you true identity. Oh, what or whom you allow in determines your outcome. If you don't like what you're perceiving, you need Dr. Jesus to make you whole, a whole new creation in him. In him, we have refuge, safety, perspective, the way, the truth, and the life. Pray this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, just pray that out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, here's my best communication. You died on the cross for me rose up from the grave. I need you to save me. In you I live. I'm born again. With true identity, forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Father God loves me. Now I'm his child. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app 
with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.